Their memories are the essence of you, but there are reasons not to believe in your old memories. Wow. Um, and, and, and she was indeed correct. Part of the problem is that misinformation is everywhere. But I, I do have to say that we have something in common, that I too have very warm and fuzzy memories about Claudia. Um, so I shall not be dissuaded. And if I remember correctly, um, Elizabeth just celebrated a birthday um, this past Wednesday, October 16th. So happy birthday. <laughs> I think, you know, if true, if true. <laughs> but we are going to uh, move on to our next guest. And our, our, our next guest, everybody, is, like, is famous. <laughs> like, like famous, famous. <laughs> Um, his film credits include The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, um, The Fisher King, Bad Influence, Saving Your Business, Fearless, Multiplicity, Women on Top. Ooh, love the sound of that. Um, <laughs> the Big Time, Rain On Me, uh, and The Marriage Counselor, just to name a few. He has appeared in numerous television shows, including Torchwood, I love Torchwood, um, Breaking Bad, CSI, Sports Night, I love Sports Night, and I wasn't even a sports fan, that tells you how good the show actually was. Um, the Unit, West Wing, Judging Amy, The Closer, Legend, LA Law, uh, Picket Fences, Civil Wars, uh, The Practice, Touched by an Angel, I probably shouldn't have mentioned Touched by an Angel here, but okay. <laughs> Pretend you didn't hear that one. Uh, but nerd that I am, I, I loved him most in Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> so here to give us cold comfort, please welcome John Delaney. <laughs> silently and uh, I was about to move on when the young man started handing out sandwiches. He carefully placed a wrapped sandwich in each of the outstretched hands and said with gentle sincerity, Jesus loves you. As the homeless walked away, unwrapping their precious gifts, the young man and I were left looking at one another. I broke the spell by reaching into my pocket and handing him a $20 bill and said, it's to buy more sandwiches. Now, I have been an atheist of a sort all my life. For me, there was no dramatic conversion, no great sense of betrayal. It was about as simple and as uncomplicated as not wanting to eat liver. <laughs> you could smother it with onions, and bacon, but as far as I was concerned, it was still liver, and I didn't like it. <laughs> At the age of seven, I remember being told that Jonah lived in a whale. <laughs> what? <laughs> he lived in a whale, my Sunday school teacher affirmed. It's true. Well, my little man's self knew that statement to be false. 
People don't live in Wales except maybe Pinocchio. <laughs> What's going on here? A year or so later, I was at a Cub Scout meeting. It took place in a rec room. Remember, this is the 50s. Of a house a couple of blocks from my own. In the middle of the room, in the middle of a table, was a giant plate of donuts. As I reached for that big, fat, jelly donut, the den mother slapped my hand away and said, we pray first. No pray, no donuts. <laughs> oh, I'm beginning to understand. The last nail in the coffin when one was when I was about 12. My parents invited some people over to the house for dinner, people who had never been to our house before. Now, in spite of what you might think, I was a polite kid. I, I knew the rules. I dutifully waited for my mother to raise her fork when all of a sudden the guests, the man and woman who had never been to our house before, reached out and grabbed everybody's hands and with a big smile on their face said, we'd like to offer a prayer. My hands pulled away so fast. <laughs> oh, we're, we're, we're so sorry, the guest said, looking at disapprovingly at my parents, who were now embarrassed beyond all measure. It's what we do, it's, it's, it's what we believe. We just thought. Later that night, after the guests had left, my parents came to my room. Your behavior was outrageous, my father said. Dad, they are so pushy with what they did. They were being nice, and it's what they believe, and you were rude. And he walked out. I was rude. To this day, that event goes to the crux of my antagonism. <laughs> what they did was not nice. It was calculated. And it wasn't the first time they had pulled that stunt. They were grabbing people's hands all over town. <laughs> and nobody dared resist because everybody had to be polite. And they knew that. And they took advantage of it. As far as I was concerned, it was an invasion of the body snatchers right there at our dinner table. <laughs> it was shocking. And it had the same effect on me as if my grandmother had weirdly kissed me on the lips and then stuck her tongue down. <laughs> It creeped me out. <laughs> and all the while they were smiling, secure in their thinking that they were in the right because they believed. The power behind those words, I believe, is absolutely staggering. It means you can do anything, say anything, justify anything. I believe, so you need to listen to me, respect me, but mostly you can't question me because I believe. It's the, I don't need to know anything. The, my opinion is as good and frankly better than your opinion. It's the words that entitle the believer to immunity. Because you, once you utter, I believe, you are cloaked in a protective shroud that cannot be touched. It's the words that are used in place of, I think. Because let's face it, it's a lot easier. It's the lazy man's words. The abracadabra that opens the door to a universe of absurdities, hypocrisies, and to be politically current, conspiracies. In this world of I believe, everything is game and everything is right for the picking. Now supercharge that notion of I believe with the presumption 
assume that one has been given a heavenly mandate to force those beliefs, as did those dinner guests, when they grabbed my hand with the full intention of rolling right into a prayer. And you have the volatile mixture that has fueled my lifelong gagging reflex to a type of religious self-righteous activism that has both astonished and frightened me for decades. And yet, and yet, here was this young man standing in the alley doing good. The homeless people needed a sandwich, and he was giving it to them. And I admired him for it. Jesus and a sandwich. Sure, there was a little bribery, a little no pray, no donuts attached. <laughs> but something much more important was happening. He was giving comfort. I have a smart, kind friend who is deeply religious and who is sure that when he dies, he will see his mother again. It gives him comfort. A couple of years ago, by happenstance, I found myself in a hospital at the bedside of an elderly dying woman who mistakenly thought I was the minister she was waiting for. <laughs> Oh, the irony. <laughs> As I sat next to her, holding her hand and reciting the Lord's Prayer over and over until she quieted down and fell asleep, it gave her comfort. And I was happy to be able to do it. I have another friend, a pediatric oncologist, who is front and center at the tragic death of children every day of the week. She is a devout atheist, and yet one of the first things that she ascertains is whether the family is religious. She has discovered that most families will cope better with the tragedy they are about to face if they are religious. I recognize the value of comfort. I recognize that my sandwich, to some, doesn't look at all like a tuna on rye with lots of ale, or a BLT with extra bacon. No, not at all. My, my sandwich is a reality sandwich. And while it might seem like cold comfort to some, I'm here to tell you, as many of you already know, it's a very tasty sandwich. <laughs> my sandwich comes with no strings attached, no promises. You see, I don't want to live in an imaginary world that takes credit for the compassionate actions that come to me naturally. I already know how to be charitable, ethical, and moral. Those are human traits. I want to live in a world where truth is imperishable, eternal, immortal, and needs no human agency to support it. Thank you, Melanie Malone. Where the love I have for my friends and family don't need to be approved. That's the comfort I seek and the comfort a reality sandwich offers. I want to be free to witness the wonders of the universe, not through the tired old eyes of religious hypocrites, unimaginative, uninspired, and unenlightened. I want to live in a world where people are curious, not frightened by knowledge. I want to live in a world where knowing is more sought after and more valued than believing, where I can draw comfort from the fact that my life's effort will contribute yet one more brick to the never-ending, always-expanding road of human understanding and kindness, a road
road I take comfort in helping to build while accepting the reality that I will never get to travel it fully. And the bricks on that road cannot be laid by liars and hypocrites. That golden path is going to be laid by the seven-year-olds who can tell the difference between truth and fiction. By the ten-year-olds who can recognize when they're being manipulated and lied to. And by the twelve-year-olds who have the courage to cut the head of the snake before they get bitten. That's why I am currently working on two projects, two little homegrown projects to be sure, that address critical thinking and what happens when you let the believers take, the, take over the school system. So let me show you. This is new to me. <laughs> Recently, I had the pleasure of meeting Eli Noyes, talented filmmaker known for his animation, moving graphics, and short films. I don't know if you know this, but Eli, at the age of 23, got a, um, uh, he's my age, actually a little older, at the age of 23, he got a, um, uh, nomination for an Academy Award because he did the c first claymation and the first one he did was called Evolution. Some of you might remember having seen that. Let me see. Oh yeah, these are some of the things he says. I told Eli uh, about an idea I had to create 60-second animations that would debunk intelligent design. As I'm sure you know, intelligent design is a pseudo-scientific rehash of creationism. The idea has been around for a very long time. From Plato to Paley, the notion is that every living thing is so perfect Per perfectly designed in both form and function that only a divine creator could have designed it. It's a simple idea and attractive to some, but intelligent design is completely unsupported by facts. And yet many religious people insist that intelligent design must be taught in biology classrooms, either alongside evolution or as a replacement, because regardless of the facts, because regardless of the fact that it's bogus, intelligent design fits nicely into their beliefs. The next person to join, oh, did I do that? Oh, yeah, there you go. The next person to join our team was Dr. Abby Hafer, and I'm sure many of you know her, a zoologist with a doctorate at Oxford, from Oxford. Abby wrote a well-known book called The Not-So-Intelligent Designer, and why evolution explains the human body and intelligent design does not. In consultation with Abby, we decided to initially concentrate on three design flaws, the eye, the testicles, <laughs> and the windpipe. This is pretty cool. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, all bad designs. Now the purpose, oh God Almighty. <laughs> Speaking of this, yeah. how do I make that go back? Uh, uh, there we go. No, I've got it. I've got it. There we go. There we go. There we go. Oh, I see some of the jokes. <laughs> the purpose of this exercise. Uh, supposed to be now. Uh, the eye. Yeah, I think I should be back one. There we go. 
Uh, the purpose of this exercise is to give our target audience of 10 to 12 year olds a few facts that will help them push back against the religious nonsense they sometimes have to listen to. We're not teaching beyond biology, we're just giving the kids a few tools. In the parlance of intelligent design, we're providing the wedge. Because it's good to know that there's nothing intelligent about designing an eye with a blind spot in it. There's nothing intelligent about exposing men's <laughs> testicles, especially when other species get them neatly tucked away out of harm's way. And uh, there is nothing intelligent about using the same pipe to both eat and breathe unless you want to choke to death, and about 5,000 people every year in America get to do just that. This project is dedicated to that lonely kid out there who's sitting in some pew or around a dinner table listening to a bunch of adults crank on about heavenly matters, knowing in his heart of hearts that Jonah did not live in a way. And that the real world is far more truthful, interesting, and wondrous than anything his elders could have ever imagined. And we are calling our project God's Lord. The reason I'm bringing this up as opposed to just writing about what it is that I'm, why it is that I feel the way I do and telling it to those of you who feel the same way and wondering if we are kind of talking in a circular way, is that I have decided and I encourage all of you to do the same thing. And if I can be of help, I will. So I want that to be really made clear. If I can be helpful, I will. And I ask you to be helpful to me. In other words, we can work together. I think it's time to start creating, there are a lot of creative people I happen to write a little, and I happen to know people who can do you know, some animations. But there are so many of you who have other connections and other talents. So the first one in which I'm doing has to do with, for me, that 10-year-old kid. It was really important to me as a, well, I might say 10-year-old, but when I was seven years old and the, uh, the Sunday school teacher said to me, Jonah lived in a whale, and I was like, whoa, I don't know, there's something really wrong here. And that sort of got me just the little beginning of that crack, that crack that I began going, oh, I know, it just doesn't seem to be quite true, and I need to know more, and it's really important. And that extended into, I was a kid who was very, who has dyslexia, I, I, I still do, obviously. Uh, it took me a long time to read, one of the first books in which I read flunking out of a couple of schools was Jules Verne's um, Mysterious Island. And I was so impressed by these guys who had escaped in a, uh, in a hot air balloon and got blown across the ocean to Mysterious Island. How much they knew. How much they knew. And how willing they were to make things work no matter what. They could be walking along and they could look at a, at a bank of dirt and they go, there's iron in there. I go, oh my God, how do they do that? And we will be able to smelt that iron. We'll be able to you know, create fires and get iron out of it and create tools. I wanted to be that type of person. And so I have spent in a small way, you know, I'm an actor, so in a very small way, um, doing those type of things. I, I recently was able to take a, a long trip, the trip that I have been taking for myself as a, in a lifetime. Uh, to, I, I, sailing means a great deal to me. So I sailed to the, from California to the Marqueses and to the Tuamotos and to the, to the Society Islands. And then I sailed 52 days back. I got to, and, and, and one of the things when I was out there, I kept on going, you know, this is one of the few places in the world where it's still the same. The ocean is still the same. I'm on the same ocean 
that Captain Cook was on, or you know, or or Captain Bly, or you know, any of those those people who I who I uh, um, heroes who I, I, I were so important to me. And so, in any case, one of the things in which I've decided to do is that I've I've decided that it's really time for me to make things and to hand them out and to know full well that they're going to just be seen by a few people. But every once in a while, you never know. Uh, what was mentioned before is like Breaking Bad, an interesting story. I played a, a character on the Breaking Bad where I was the father, or the father of the daughter who was a drug addict. And she was involved with, with uh, the, the lead. And she and, and 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 she ends up dying. And all you see in that show is me being being so so obsessed and so wanting to to take care of my daughter. That was my, my role. I usually play assholes. So, <laughs> so it, it was it was nice to be able to play someone like that. I had I've had this happen. Uh, almost three times, two almost identical uh, kids. There I call them kids, 25 years old. You coming up to me uh, uh, separate times each other. Um, you could tell right off the bat, ooh, this is a, this is a, a young man who is really, um, uh, he's, he's, um, he has a hard life. So things are tough. coming up to me and kind of looking at me askance and going, hey man, uh, are you Jane's father? Jane was my daughter's name. Hey man, are you, are you Jane's father? And I go, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, now I know what my parents went through. Wow. That's the one thing that theater, movies, television, theater, talking, one on one can do. I, that show gave him the opportunity to see something that he could not see. His own parents had said to him uh, a thousand times, and his ministers, and his, his teachers, and his friends had said, you gotta stop, you gotta stop, you gotta stop. He didn't see anything. He saw it this way, and all of a sudden he empathized, and he went, ah, oh, now I kind of understand. That was just one. There might be, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, two or three hundred out there, because the show was quite popular. I'm doing these things, knowing full well, these little animations, knowing full well, they're not going to be shown everywhere. But if I can get a dozen kids who go, oh, well, you know what? Mom and Dad, or, or you know, evangelical mom and dad. Um, if uh, if God is so uh, so smart, then why did He create a, a a pipe here where you have to eat and and uh, breathe at the same time? Because you end up choking that way. Just that little bit, I think, is important. That that's for that group. For you, age-wise, I'm doing another thing. Uh, the second project I'm working on is a play about the 2005 Dover Intelligent Design Trial. I went around the country uh, with Ed Asner doing the Scopes Monkey Trial, the actual trial transcripts. Uh, I had, this is where I really came front and center with what uh, evangelical thinking you do in the world of education. We would do our show at different um, colleges. Ed would talk at one college, I would talk at another, and in this particular college, which happened to be the University of Nebraska in, in Lincoln, um, I talked to about 100 kids, and I answered all their questions, and at the end, the teacher said, well, thank you very much, Mr. Lansing, and I said, thank you, and he said, I hope you see the show tonight, it's only one more performance. I saw it last night, it was really terrific, and I said, thank you, thank you, and then he gave me a look, which was, look at what I did. 
And he said, I want to sh uh, I'd like to have a show of hands. How many of you believe that the world was created 4004 BC, October 23rd, at 10 o'clock in the morning? And about 80 kids raised their hands. College kids. College kids. And at that moment, I didn't go, <laughs> I, I didn't do that. What happened was I went, oh. <laughs> like this. I, I didn't do it quite as expressively as I'm doing it now. And I went, oh, like that. I remember looking down at my shoes, and I remember thinking, in a way, all of curiosity has left this room. All of curiosity has left this room. I went that night uh, for the sh uh, getting ready for the show, at a half hour, and I told the cast the story, and there was a there was a young girl there. You know, some college kids were helping with us get ready for the show, whatever. And and she was very nice. She had been there the night before, and I said to her, whatever her name is, Mary. I said, Mary, would you have raised your hand? And she said, Oh yes, yes, I would. And I said, Why, Mary? She said, Because God is my bus driver. <laughs> Mary, I, I have no idea what that means. It, means. it means I can go to the back of my bus and party hardy because God is driving my bus. And um, those two events have really solidified for me the need to not just talk amongst ourselves, but to actually begin to go out. The amount of, of effort and money and very sophisticated um, means of communications that are being employed by the other side, dare I say, is really staggering. If you want to see something that is truly disgusting, go and watch Ken Ham talk to, um, talk to you know, third grade. Um, so I, I have, since that experience, sort of devoted my, this is my, my, you know, my, my hobby, I mean, my, my passion. Uh, so in any case, my next project, as I said, is, um, is, uh, is the um, Dover Intelligent Design. It's a story of how a school board was sued by a number of courageous parents and how the judge, after a trial of 40 days and 40 nights, <laughs> <laughs> rendered a verdict which is staggeringly marvelous and smart. The script is taken directly from the trial transcripts. The show will get its first official reading uh, this coming March to an audience of um, 2,000. Uh, um, uh, I don't know, do, do any of you, I've sort of been, uh, any of you have heard about these Star Trek cruises? Yeah. I love them because it's a captured audience. <laughs> I'm not going to sing any songs, I'm not going to talk about, uh, you know, Romulans and, and what have you. They get to see it. The Scopes Monkey Drive. <laughs> and they get to see the Dover Intelligent Design Trial, and, and, uh, and they all love it. I mean, really. Okay. Uh, later, it's going to be recorded, and it's going to be made available for free. Um, uh, uh, for the world at large. So as far as I'm concerned, you're going to all have digital recordings, and you're going to shove them down the throats of so, uh, <laughs> all your friends. Uh, because it's an interesting story uh, about, first of all, intelligent design. But then it's a story which I think under the current political atmosphere has some reverberations how um, the people who maintain that they have a lock on morality and ethics and how you're supposed to behave um, found absolutely no problem in lying for Jesus 
to the point in which in a federal courtroom, the judge, Judge Jones, ended up saying, sir, you are lying. You are lying. And I'm going to hold you in contempt if you continue this. And he did. <laughs> what I'm up to. <laughs> uh, thank you for allowing me to speak in front of you. Um, I, I have just a few more minutes, and I, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but given the fact that I started off by getting thrown out of schools, so I'm school for not doing what I was allowed to do. Um, if there are any questions that I can uh, answer, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions, you have to just sing out. Yes, sir. How do I get to be in the 2000? How do you get to be in the 2000 what? What sees your uh, production? Tom Cruise. Oh, you mean, how does it get to be done? There's plenty of where it is. Oh, how do you get to yeah, do yeah. that? Oh, well, you have to ante up a lot of money to uh, CBS, that's right. But I, I have nothing to do with that one. Uh, there's no money. There's no, one of the things in which I want to be really clear about, it's, these are not being done to make any money. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, hey, yes. I have a question. Yes. Okay, so, you play Q on Star Trek. And at that point in time, I'm assuming that you were an atheist at that time. So, Q was sort of a god. Right? So, how, how did you feel as an internal person playing atheist, playing a god? <laughs> well, the question is, and I will take it as a serious one. Um, <laughs> it is, um, uh, when I played Q, a, as you said, sort of a god, how did I justify that or, or reconcile that with the fact that I um, am an atheist? I have played a lot of characters. <laughs> you know, I played, um, I played um, very disturbing uh, I played a character called Vibau, uh, the uh, who ran the um, the camp in, in, in the, the the Nazi who ran the camp in in, uh, in, in um, I, uh, A year ago, I played a version of Trump 2.0, <laughs> which is to say, really smart, <laughs> as opposed to not so smart, um, and very charismatic as opposed to boorish, and um, and. Uh, uh, really dangerous be 